Welcome to the Beauty and Surgeon podcast. I'm Dr. Martin, Dr. Jason Martin. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon, and we're here with Amy, a nutritional therapist, and we have a really cool topic today. It's a little bit esoteric, which is um, usual for our podcast, but we're talking about otoplasty or cosmetic ear surgery. How many people come to our clinic and want their ears addressed? I would say it is fairly rare, but not completely obsolete. Yeah. Like it's a pre- I mean, it, it's definitely a requested surgery. It's a niche procedure. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a good thing, though, because it means that people who are reaching out to us have probably done at least a little bit of research to even know that we do it. Right. And I think a lot of people probably start their search for someone to do their otoplasty with an ENT surgeon. You know, so it's... I think that it's not that there aren't so many people looking for it. I think the people who are looking for it are perhaps a little bit more educated and discerning. Right. Go otoplasty patients. Yeah, exactly. For being educated and discerning. So I was trained by a craniofacial surgeon. I love doing ear pinning or otoplasty surgeries. Uh, It definitely is a niche procedure. Um, Most of the people that do it are craniofacial surgeons or people with a plastic surgery training. There's definitely some ENT surgeons that do it, but it's a majority, it's a plastic surgery procedure. Uh, there's two different types of patients that will get it. It'll be a young kid, right, mm-hmm. with really prominent ears or someone who's older who's had prominent. Are you staring at my ears right now? Well, I am now. Okay. Right. But not because they stick out. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, someone who's older who uh, has had prominent ears for their entire life and said, enough is enough. Yeah. We need, we need a change. So otoplasty, uh, a.k.a. ear pinning, which is the layperson term, but actually that's not really correct because otoplasty encompasses a lot of things. You can change uh, ears that are larger, uh, change ears that are smaller or more prominent. And then in kind of high level procedures and something called microtia, uh, you can actually change ears that don't have all their parts. Mm-hmm. Like un- maldeveloped or underdeveloped exactly. ears. So that's the one thing I think it's really important. So we love doing this podcast, Empowerment, Education, Transformation. This is more of an educational podcast because even though 5% of all people have prominent ears, only a few of those really want to get it taken care of. But this is an interesting podcast. We're going to go through the history of why ears are different in some people, and it's related to their development. And that's where I really totally dig on it. So Mm -hmm. this is a fun educational podcast. And if you're out there and you have prominent ears, there's an answer. Otoplasty. All right, so let's get started. Microtia. We talked about that before, uh, is related to ears that don't have all their parts. And that would be, um, you know, a child, baby that's born, and they they have a deformed ear, basically. Uh, There are amazing surgeries for that. We're not going to go through all those today. Can I ask a question? Sure. So of the children that are born with this, is it typically just an external issue, or do they generally have some type of internal component that's not quite right as well? This is why I love you. This is such a good question. Because the external ear actually comes from one area, and the internal ear comes from another. But the ear, the external ear, is kind of like a sounding board. If you have something wrong with your external ear, that uh, uh, clues the, or cues the uh, pediatricians into looking for other problems. Mm-hmm. External ear deformities are associated with a lot of craniofacial abnormalities and syndromes. And a lot of those have inner ear problems. So you may have someone with an external ear problem, and they may, there's like a higher likelihood they'll have an internal ear problem, Mm -hmm. a hearing problem, and there could be other problems that you don't see right away. Mm -hmm. So the ears are one of the first things that cue these uh, uh, pediatricians into there being a problem. Uh, These surgeries to reconstruct ears that don't have all their parts are amazing, amazing. So uh, I did a surgery, and we do this all the time at universities and high-end craniofacial surgeon offices. Uh, the patient had no, literally no ear, all right? That's called a notia, A-N-O-T-I-A or whatever. Is that like a little nubbin of cartilage or anything? Yeah, a little nubbin there. And we took um, cartilage and bone from the rib, recreated the cartilage in the ear, and buried it into the skull area mm-hmm. near the ear, and then elevate that as a flap three months later. Nice. And That's cr- so cool. And created an ear. To like pop out yeah. after it had a chance to kind of integrate. And integrate underneath the skin. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. And that, how did you close the deficit behind? Just uh, a little Yeah, you can rotation. do a rotation flap or you can do, if you had to, do skin grafts or something like that. So That's uh, really cool. I would love to have a whole podcast on that, but that would be so nerdy and no one would ever listen. With that said, that's 
that right there is the essence of plastic surgery, right? That's what we do, is you have a problem that no one thinks you can solve, and you're creative enough that you can come up with an answer that is almost outlandish. You take someone's rib, you, you whittle the rib down in the cartilage and shape it into a shape of an ear, bury it underneath the skin, and then three months later, you have not a perfect ear, but something pretty close yeah. to it. And then they started creating um, silicone uh, prosthesis that would go underneath the skin, just like the bone, and you would do the same thing with that, so you wouldn't even have to take the rib. Yeah, So build up that strength. Y- yep. Um, and it wasn't just silicone, it was other substrates. So that's really cool. But today we're talking about uh, otoplasty. And in most cases, people think about what? Like pinning back the mm-hmm. ears, right? Like Dumbo ears. Prominent ears. Yeah. And, and we've had kids in our practice, we do this surgery a lot, and they're so cute. They come in, the cutest little kids, and they have these very prominent ears. I mean, you see, they're all ear, Yep. right? And you can absolutely understand why a parent would be concerned about that. Especially if they had that problem right. growing up. And we actually had a patient who's one of the family members was a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting because we talked to him and the mom about, uh, you know, the process of the um, otoplasty procedure. And uh, the, it was the family member who brought up the fact that it's better to do these surgeries before a certain age. Mm-hmm. We tend to do it for children uh, usually less than eight or seven years of age because before that they don't have abstract reasoning, right? So they can't think abstractly, they think logically. And so you would not want a kid to be insecure about the fact that they had to get their ears pinned, right? You want them to think, well, okay, I have prominent ears, I need to get them pinned back, that's fine, and then I can move on with my life. Past seven or eight, they can you can create other problems mm-hmm. for them. But they also need to be for us, usually over the age of five. Yep. And uh, five is the, really the cutoff, um, the lower part of the age. Um, and that's when you want to bring them in uh, after five years of age because you want the ear to grow a little bit. Mm-hmm. The ear doesn't stop growing until you're about nine years old. And so you want it to be somewhat developed before you would start doing surgery on that. We talked about one of our other podcasts. Uh, is there a way from birth, if you make your baby wear a headband, to flatten their ears out. Yeah, so I talked about in that podcast that it's up to six months, and that was kind of correct, but I actually looked at the research. It, they actually say in the first four days. Right. So you have to be right there. Right. Kids coming out, like, put that little headband on. You put on. the LeBron James right. headband Get on. Get the sweatband When that out. baby literally comes out of the birthing canal. <laughs> <laughs> you see prominent ears, you just get the duct tape and you wrap them up as tight as possible. Don't do that. Okay. Is duct tape inappropriate? <laughs> yeah, don't duct tape oh, your sorry. baby's ears down. Just want to make sure that Headband's that, okay. Optional wristbands. The bands. hospital would charge you $100 for the duct tape. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, they would. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yeah, so it's, they say the first four days, but they say up to six months. Uh, and that has to do with the mother uh, has obviously estrogen, and that circulates mm-hmm. in the child at a higher level. Estrogen makes cartilage more flexible and moldable, and so you could put it in a proper position. If you have really prominent ears, you could actually uh, pin, the ears, pin the ears back with a wrap or some sort of compression garment, uh, and that would ultimately shape the ears and get rid of the problem that you have. So if your baby's more than four days old, just let it ride. Let it ride. Let it ride. So prominent ears are actually pretty common, mm-hmm. you know, and, and a lot of people don't fix it. And, uh, you know, for children, the ones that we fix uh, are children that really are prominent, mm-hmm. right? So they're not, the parents aren't nitpicking their children. Right. They're not being crazy or vain. Or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, we do, f- uh, on adults who have prominent ears and maybe they're mild to moderate, we do fix those. Yeah. Because, hey, they just don't want prominent ears. Right. They can sign a consent. They've dealt with it all their life. Yeah. We did it. I mean, we do it before weddings, you know, people who are just sick of always wearing their hair down. You know, women, we have that you know, luxury of being able to wear our hair over our ears. But even there's one, she ran the, the picture of her sister. You know, her sister had normal ears. Her ears kind of poked out and, like, it just drove her crazy her whole life. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, some people come in and you'll look at them and you'll be like, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I see it, but not really. They're like, listen, Dr. Martin, I know it, it's not too prominent, but this is something that's bothered me forever. So let's talk about ear development. So this is where, really where everyone starts to go to sleep. Right. Well, if you're listening, make sure you switch over to YouTube and watch it so you can see our slides. Yeah. So we, this is where we talk about embryology. 
Did you you took anatomy? I well, I taught anatomy, but my one of my first college professor anatomy professors was an embryologist. Yeah. So he always loved. He calls it Festus the fetus. He would draw on the board like basically every day I come into class and he'd be there on the whiteboard drawing Festus. Yeah. Festus the fetus, talking about gills and tails and all that kind of. It's fun amazing. Stuff. I mean, you look at embryology and you look at the development of the fetus or a human being, a young baby. And what they start from, if you go to our YouTube channel right now, you can see this picture. This right. is of a human baby a or human baby. Yeah, fish. It's, it's within the first 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And it looks like a tadpole, you know. Uh, it has this notochord in the back, which ultimately ends up being the spinal cord. And then you see what appears to be a head. It looks like a manatee, right? Mm -hmm. And the neck of a manatee is where the, they have these pharyngeal arches and clefts. And that's where all this stuff in the face comes from. Our ears come from our neck. Mm -hmm. They all come from little gills. I know. Yeah. And they come from the front part of the neck, and then they rotate up to your ear position. There's multiple, um, there's multiple outcroppings. They call them HELOCs. Let's get to that real quick here. And those HELOCs um, are masses or no nodules that grow and grow and grow and then coalesce into the ear while it's moving from the neck up to where the ear is. It's extremely complex. There was this guy, Hiss, H-I-S. Um, I'm assuming it's a doctor who described this. So they, they called it the Hiss blah, 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 or something of Hiss. And uh, he talked about how these coalesce together. And the really cool part is that you can actually see over time with development. Uh, they had these pictures, and we showed this before here. You can see, uh, this is another slide that we're showing. You can see how this ear kind of rotates up, and these um, outcroppings from the neck area uh, rotate to where the ear is and then form the ear structures. Yeah. And the only thing that's not formed from this area is the lobule or where you pierce your ears. So That's kind of last. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool how that happens. When you actually look at this and, you know, if you have interest in this, you should look this up. When you actually look at it, you can understand why it gets so out of whack. Mm -hmm. You know, how, why, you know, so many, why it's a common presentation. I mean, not very common, but that's why you see it's more common than you would think that people have issues with their ears. And some of those are benign or, uh, like my daughter has accessory cartilage in front of her tragus. Mm -hmm. The tragus is the, how would you describe this? The cartilage in front of the- It's what you push to block out hearing. Exactly, thank yep. you. Amy, lay person, it's the no, translation. It's the no soundy. <laughs> yeah, it's what you put, when, I, when my kids yell, that's what I <laughs> no, press I down just, so I can occlude my- Right, it's the, it's yeah. the I can't hear you say like. Exactly. So uh, for for those, my, my daughter actually has accessory tragus in front of that, like an extra amount of cartilage. Really? Is it, does it have its own little like skin flap? No, it, it, it doesn't one? look like a full tragus. So it's really just a little bump, yeah. Uh, when, we, when I was in training in uh, craniofacial surgery, uh, we would, a lot of times for people that was very prominent, we would just go in and take those out. Yeah, it was really interesting. It yeah, it's yeah. just a little piece of cartilage yep. just sitting there. Uh, you see people with, uh, the angle that the ear comes off from the head is um, very prominent, meaning that it doesn't, the angle when the ear comes off from the head is not a small angle, it's, a, it's an obtuse or a greater angle. And you're you see, meaning at the top part of the ear. Top part of the ear, yeah. You can have the cartilage in the ears underdeveloped, overdeveloped, you can have pointy ears, uh, you can have ears that droop over. Uh, it's, there's so many different you know, presentations. And then like we talked about with microtia, you can have loss of, of uh, structures on the ear itself. So know that your ear starts developing about five weeks and then it doesn't stop developing until you're nine years old. Pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. And it starts again. <laughs> and then after that, it just gets hairier for men. And, and bigger. It seems bigger. It's, you know, I was looking that up because I'm not really sure they, they totally keep growing, but they have to because okay. you've seen those old men. That, Your ears are huge. They're huge. They're like literally yeah. the size of my hands. But it's like noses. I feel like it's somewhat just that ligamentous structure and like the cartilage, everything kind of like loosens up and maybe just stretches. And they just get very hairy. They get very hairy. Well, actually, this, uh, this is maybe a good point to ask this question. My older brother has very small ears. Yep. They're perfectly developed, but I mean, his ears are tiny. Like, it's like a child's ear on a man's head. Right. But they, I mean, they've, you know, like, they look totally normal. Right. But they also look like they're like a third of the size that they should be. What was the movie be. where the, he shrunk to his head? Um, it was a, oh, it's such a Men famous. Men in Black? No, a famous movie from uh. the 90s. Uh, he was the, he was a ghost. Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, thank you. Ah, <laughs> see? Yeah, so he has yeah. a Beetlejuice ear. Yeah, like yeah. tiny on a normal, but I mean, yeah. developmentally totally fine. It's good hearing. Yeah, so that's kind of a hard problem to fix. Um, you know, 
things that are too big are easier, mm-hmm. ears that are too big are easier to fix, ears that are too small are a little bit harder. Uh, ears that are prominent are the most common problem we fix, and that's what we fix in our clinic. So uh, in that situation, you could do certain things. You can um, uh, do some expansions. You can also rotate some stuff around. You can add some things in there. But that's that's actually a harder problem to fix. Mm-hmm. And most people don't unless they have notable deformities like we talked about. Yeah, yeah. his ears look fine. It just makes me wonder at what point, like, did his ears just decide they're going to stop growing? No, actually, that's a really good point. <laughs> uh, do you wonder if there was a... Uh, you know, a problem with the development mm-hmm. or if that's just the way he was programmed. Yeah. And it probably was the latter. It's probably just the way he was programmed. All right, so let's talk about ear anatomy. So we know it comes from, uh, if you're watching in YouTube, Jason Martin, MD, it, it comes from uh, a tadpole, and you can see it looks like a manatee at about, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 weeks. I was like nine. Yeah, nine yeah. weeks. And then you'll see that uh, the neck area has this fullness, and that's ultimately what becomes your ears and some other things. Let's talk about the ear anatomy, Amy. How do you do this on a podcast? Talk about the ear? Yeah. Well, Google anatomy of the ear while you're listening so you can follow along. Okay, all right. (laughs) So the ear is really an interesting structure. It has uh, an external part, and that's what we're talking about today. The external part has a top part that's above the part where you hear. That's called the helix. That's the curly part. Yeah, and that's the part that everyone uh, notices when they're prominent. That's the part that sticks out or that's pointy. Just imagine Spock. If there's any Star Trek fans out there, he had a pointy helix, okay? Um, Below that area is the part where it's the concha, but it's the the bowl where the sound goes into the the tube that directs sound waves to your middle and inner ear. So there's a canal that goes in there, and people know about that because of kids. They get tubes in their ears, you know? It's that middle ear and the inner ear problem. Um, those tubes help drain out the fluid that builds up in their ear because they're your station tubes and other things that are not working well. So below that is your lobule, and that's where you pierce your ears. That's the basic part of an ear. You have the tragus in front, which Amy has already told us is what we press when we don't want to hear our kids yell. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we got four places we describe. You don't even have to go on Google with See? that, right? Like you can extrapolate that to uh, yourself. The problem is... In typical doctor fashion, you got all this cartilage in there, and we have to name the cartilage. Yes. So if you take your ear, let's just try this real quick. If you take your ear, all the listeners, and you touch the top part of your ear, which we call the helix, the part Simon that... Simon says touch the top part, top part of your ear. Top part of your ear, which is where uh, Spock has the pointy ear. And you go below that, you'll feel ridges, okay? Below that behind it or below that in front of it? Uh, below down. Down. Down in front. From the top of your ear down, okay? Not all the way to the area where the sound waves go above that. Okay, that's called the anti-helix. That cartilage there, those ridges, and if you look on the internet, if you're interested in the surgery, look on the internet, anti-helix, common spelling. Uh, Those are usually the uh, cartilage that are... uh, Is helix really a commonly spelled word? It's not... I mean, not in laypersons. Helix, H-E-L-I-X. Sometimes I don't even know where I'm living. Helix. You know? <laughs> Anti-helix. I talk to my kids in medical words in, in Latin, and they're like, what are you What are you talking about, Dad? That's tragus common spelling. Which, by the way, this is totally <laughs> off the subject. My daughter last night said, Dad, you wouldn't understand this. This is about... She was doing a project on um, amphetamines, basically. Oh, yeah. AD, can. <laughs> yeah, ADHD. She's like... You wouldn't understand this, Dad, but amphetamines affect neurotransmitters. I'm like... In the brain. Yeah. I was like, okay, really? Your dad doesn't understand that. Okay. You're, you're just a doctor. You take your project and you go away. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so the anti-helix is really the main problem for uh, ears that are prominent. The other problem area is basically how the ear attaches to your head. Um, you remember we talked about uh, the ear, if you just take your hand and on the side of your face and you go back toward your ear, okay? The ear doesn't come off the head at a really great angle. It's a pretty narrow angle. It's 15 to 20 to 25 degrees. If that angle, if that ear comes off your head at like 30 degrees, 35, we've even had 40 degrees in our office, your ears will be very prominent. And if you see someone with prominent ears, you'll never forget them, right? It really sticks out. Those are basically, those are the two issues that we're talking about today. Uh, We've established that the ear development is really amazing and complex, uh, and a lot of things can go wrong, but we're gonna talk about basically prominent ears, and that's what we said at the beginning of this talk. We're talking about ear pinning. Okay, so prominent ears. Uh, The two types of patients that come in, we mentioned this before, are younger, uh, 
greater than five or less than seven, uh, less than eight. Uh, or we do kids that are older in their teenage years once they're fully developed and um, from a you know psychiatric standpoint, they're kind of at a good place and they can understand what's going on. But usually for us, it's either kids, which are great because we love kids in our office, or they're adults. Mm -hmm. They come in for two reasons. The top of their ear, which we call the helix, which apparently, according to Amy, is not a common word in American lexicon. <laughs> okay. Also common spelling. Okay. Uh, <laughs> which is the top part of the ear, the Spock pointy part, or they come in because the ear comes off their head at a, at a really a greater angle than 25 to 30 degrees. Yeah. And something else, and you may be planning on bringing this up, like for adults specifically, like addressing how the earlobe connects to the face essentially can be something that is addressed typically in adults. It's not usually something we address in kids. Right. And we, we lump that in with like an otoplasty, but in lobule surgery or the earlobe surgery. But technically, it's it's not what the Latin word means, yes. you know. So but we just say, hey, it's an otoplasty because it's working on its ear rejuvenation surgery or whatever. So um, but you're absolutely right. You can work on that earlobe, too. A lot of people have really redundant earlobes, uh, you know, especially older patients. As you get older, those get wispy and, and kind of hangy. Um, and we reduce those down, and we do uh, a lot of these surgeries in the clinic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or people who, well, there's that genetic term for it, like when your earlobe is not loose. Pick, like a pixie ear? Yeah, yeah. Like, and they want that kind of like, yeah. you know, back, we do that too. Yep. Usually with a facelift is when we kind of address some of that stuff, though. Yep. All right, so prominent ears, they've been around since the beginning of time. If you actually look at, like, monkeys... They have pretty prominent ears, right? Yes. So I don't know why we evolved from prominent ears to less prominent ears. So we don't catch them on stuff? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> Even though the monkeys are the ones swinging around in the trees. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you look at uh, the history of these surgeries, it basically started in the 60s or 50s. And one of the, one of the kind of founders of some of the stuff we do is a pretty amazing plastic surgeon is Dr. Jack Mastardi. He was from Glasgow. He, so he's, in, he's Scottish. And he studied under Gillies. Gillies is a famous plastic surgeon. So. Oh, my goodness. So many instruments. Gillies retractors. Gillies, yeah. Yeah. Yep. We need to get more instruments named after we, him. There's Amy. a bunch in the book. I always see that. I always wondered who Gillies was. Right. He was doing ear surgery. Gillies was the man, right? So Gillies, famous plastic surgeon in the 40s and 50s. Mustardi, this guy, I read this whole history about him. He went to World War II and was a prisoner of war in Italy. Wow. And was wrote like the first book, and I'm not sure in like all books, but basically in his area or in, in Europe about being a prisoner of war. Wow. Yeah. And it was something like the sun doesn't always shine or something like that. So it was a pretty powerful book, came back, you know, got back on his feet, was an ophthalmologist and uh, before the war apparently, and then decided he wanted to do plastic surgery for one reason. When he was a prisoner of war and coming back, he saw all the damage that mm -hmm. war did to the soldiers. And so he was inspired to help them. Wow. Studied under Gillies, okay? And then uh, kind of went out on his own, became a pretty amazing plastic surgeon. He came up with this Mustardi technique, M-U-S-T-A-R-D-E technique, uh, which is how you treat the helix area, or specifically the cartilage we call the anti-helix, uh, to make it more uh, appropriate and to make the ear shape better. So uh, fast forward with his life. He was an amazing guy. In the 90s, he started the first plastic surgery hospital in Western Africa, in Ghana, and he, specifically to help people there who uh, had um, damage from war or congenital problems. There was absolutely no surgeons in the whole country. Wow. wow. And he started that. Uh, he was a real rebel rouser. As, as they've said in the British newspaper I read, he was a swashbuckler. Like a pirate? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> which I, I'm just going to start referring to people as being swashbuckling. Or, so <laughs> or he, rebel rousers. Yeah, <laughs> he would drive to the hospital and have a loaded shotgun in his, in his truck or whatever, uh, and he would shoot pheasants out the window, go do surgery, and come back and pick up the pheasants. I mean, what? why are plastic surgeons so soft these days? <laughs> right? I mean, Was I don't do any of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've never seen you shoot an animal no, from a movie No, I don't vehicle. have a loaded shotgun in my car. Well, it's illegal in Colorado to uh, shoot an animal from a vehicle. Probably. <laughs> no, definitely. But definitely I, I, is. I, I need to go to a swashbuckler school. <laughs> yeah. You need a patch. All right, anyways. It does look like a pirate. You should Google a picture that. of him. Yeah, so Jack if you go Mastarde. again on our YouTube channel, Jason Martin, MD, uh, Beauty and the Surgeon podcast, you can see a little shifty -eyed. Dr. Mastardi, which, uh, you know, kudos to him. He was a real amazing 
man, a person in our field, and, and had so many advancements, not including just for uh, like an otoplasty or ear pinning procedure. So pretty amazing guy, uh, very well respected in our field, and also has instruments named after him. Yes, he does. So anyways, what he came up with is something called the Mastardi technique. So we talked about before, and I'm just going to reiterate, and it sounds like I'm being redundant, but sometimes it's hard to understand. There's two areas, right? The helix, or specifically the anti-helix, uh, the cartilage there, it's not, the ridges aren't normal. They usually get flattened out or the way the ear comes off from your head. So Mastardi came up with these suturing techniques to make the anti-helix better. And what he came up with is to use sutures to bend the ear back, okay? And to reshape that helix, uh, excuse me, the anti-helix area to, uh, to give it a more normal shape with the suturing. It doesn't seem like that's that complicated, but it was at the time. And that's what we do. The good part is you don't have to make any incisions in front of the ear, you can do it from behind. Uh, the other part of the surgery of an otoplasty is actually um, suturing the ear back. So we talked about the ear comes off the head at a, at a larger angle. We actually take the whole ear and the concha, which is if you grab behind your ear and you feel this outcropping, almost where the ear um, meets your, your head, we sew that back and secure that down. Those are the two things we do. So those are conchal sutures and then also the sutures on the antihelix. Those are the two things we do. Mm -hmm. We do it all from an incision behind the ear. So the cool part is if you're an adult, we can do this with you awake. So if you have prominent ears out there, maybe they're mild to moderate, and you're like, I don't know, what I do this? Well, it takes, how long does it take us, about an hour? Oh, about an hour. Yeah, yeah. at the most. Yep, it's really not long. Yeah, and we can numb up your ears and do it, and mm -hmm. you walk out. Yeah. With your LeBron James headband That's on. right. You yeah. do have to rock yeah. a LeBron James headband. How long like do we have them wear that? Six weeks. Yeah. Yeah, which honestly, for some people, actually is a deal killer. We had a patient who came in for an otoplasty consult, and she was ready to book, but she like absolutely refuses to. She refused to wear a headband at all. That's surprising because headbands are like in right now, especially for women. They are, and she said no, not even for a day. I'm like, like, could you wear it just at night? Like, I mean, like any type of compromise we come to, and she said absolutely not. I'm like, she has a real phobia of headbands. Yeah, it, it seemed really odd. And I, you know, she said it in front of the front desk too, and they kind of when she walked out, we were both kind of like, really? Like, I know. You know, but I mean, but there again, I mean, and who knows? I'm never going to judge somebody for their decisions. I mean, it could just be she wasn't ready to do the surgery, and that was kind of her thing. Like, oh, perfect, I can't wear a headband. No, I can't do this. I can't wear a headband. Yeah. You know, and that's fine. But yes, you do need to wear something to support that cartilage as it kind of heals in that new position for about six weeks. Right. The the surgery itself takes an hour, uh, both for kids and for adults. You know, maybe an hour and a half at the most. Kids will uh, give sedation or usually put to sleep just for comfort. You know. Yeah, not uh, to traumatize. Not them to too. traumatize the child. Uh, for adults, uh, it's pretty easy to do with you awake, but you can also do it with you asleep. We often combine it with um, facelifts, and that's because the incisions are basically in the same mm -hmm. area with facelifts, too. As we said before, the incision is behind the ear, uh, so you, no one will ever see it. You'd have to literally p uh, take your ears and pull them out to show somebody. And even then, they may not see it. Because of the way that skin is back there behind the ear, there's, there's very little... Yeah like sun exposure, hair growth, anything else that might disrupt a scar from healing well, like it's, it's hidden. Like if you were, if you run your finger, you know, along your head, touching your ear, that's where it goes. It's in that little crease right there. So even if you were to pull it back, I think a normal person would still have trouble perceiving that. Right. Cause it's just right tucked in. Uh, we do use permanent sutures in the surgery and that means they don't do not dissolve. So we've had a few patients where we've had to, you know, part of that permanent suture has poked out through the incision mm -hmm. line. We've had to trim that. We've never really had a problem with that, fortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was few and far between. Other than that, uh, it's really straightforward. It's such a neat procedure. It's very technical, and that's what I love about it, because you have to put those sutures in a like, perfect position. And for someone who has obsessive compulsive problems, mm -hmm. I could do otoplasties all day long and just make that suture perfect. It would get it all out of my system. <laughs> And especially when it's a, you know when you're doing these surgeries, and especially when it's a young child, okay, and you're look at this beautiful angelic child, and the parents are out there, and you're like, I'm going to make this GD ear perfect, you know, because like for those parents, for this child, and you realize that, I mean, if you get it within 95 percent, that's good, you know, there, no one's going to know the difference, but it is a little bit of a challenging procedure, but it is absolutely not a high risk procedure per se. There are some other ways to do. Um, to reshape the anti-helix. Remember, that's the area above the part where the sound goes into your ear. 
Um, you can, and you, if you look again on our YouTube channel, you can burr it down with a burr. Uh, some people have scored it, and there's different names. These are all like the famous people in plastic surgery, Pitongue, all these different names. When I was looking at all this up, mm -hmm. it's all the famous people in plastic yeah. surgery. So apparently, you got to do two things to be famous in plastic surgery. You got to have instruments named after you, Absolutely. and you got to do some variation of an otoplasty, right? <laughs> oh, this is the same. Let's get to work. Any yeah. surgery. Let's yeah, work. let's yeah. figure out a way to let's make get this to better. Work. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then this is the suture, which is so confusing. This this picture here. Uh, Most people aren't going to understand where that suture's going. It doesn't. It looks like a worm. I'm not even sure what that looks like. <laughs> basically, if you look at this picture, that's the the area above is where the hearing the the sound goes in. Mm -hmm. And then what this do is securing back that ear to a better angle, so it's not so prominent. Um, let's talk about recovery. So you have a small incision behind your ear, kind of in the crease of your ear where the ear almost meets your head. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about how long? Maybe, um, I want to say two and a half centimeters, but uh, maybe an yeah, inch. Yeah, half an inch, two and a half an inch, yeah. depending on the person and how Probably a little bit more like bad an inch. it is, like yeah. an inch. Yeah. Uh, the surgery takes an hour. If you're awake, you numb it up. You just, you don't, literally don't feel it. If you're asleep, uh, you won't wake up with a lot of discomfort. So if you have a child and the child has prominent ears, you don't have to worry that they're gonna wake up and have tons mm -hmm. of pain. Uh, the recovery that it, it can be uncomfortable, right? But it's not. I wouldn't call it painful. No, I think what makes it uncomfortable is just because there's really nowhere for swelling in the ears to go right. because it is so much cartilage and not a lot of soft tissue. So it's not like a leg or an arm where there's like a lot of soft tissue and muscle and other places for that inflammation to kind of go. So it's it's tight, and that's what most people end up feeling is it feels tight, it feels tight, it feels achy, and you know, making you sleep on your back, and if you're a side sleeper, that can be hard. You know, so it, there's those things that make challenge that make recovery challenging. Not being able to side sleep for you know two to four weeks at least, having to sleep at a little bit of an incline for the first week, and then of course rocking the LeBron James headband. Yeah. Does LeBron James know that we're talking about him on our podcast? LeBron James doesn't care about <laughs> PG and the Surgeon podcast. <laughs> we could we could have him on. We could. And talk to him about otoplasties. We could. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he'd bring us some headbands. We should have Nils, our <laughs> producer, call his his booking agent and see if he can come on over. We just Denver. need some headbands. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, so it's not a big recovery. It's not super painful. Mm -hmm. You can have swelling. You don't want the swelling to be too bad. There's something called cauliflower ear. You see that in uh, kind of wrestlers. So after surgery, if you get bad swelling or uh, even maybe not as great also uh, is bleeding around the area where you worked on then uh, you would have to address that right away and take that bleeding out or somehow reduce the swelling but i've personally never seen that it's not a huge area you elevate so it'd be unlikely to have this but you could have it yeah and it's not a terribly vascular area either because there again we're working primarily with cartilage which is avascular right i used to one of the guys i worked with used to do quilting sutures just to kind of really mm. bring down that skin, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it was a pretty big otoplasty and that's something you can do and that just kind of tacks down the skin so it doesn't affect anything and you pull those out later on. One thing I definitely do, especially in kids, is do a bolster dressing after surgery, which is with this uh, medicated gauze like Xeroform and it's tied around the ear and pushes that skin down right onto that cartilage. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really helpful. That stays for about a week. The long-term effect of these are really good. Uh, the two things that you worry about with the notoplasty, so if you have a child and, you're, and they have prominent ears or you're, you're, you're interested in the surgery, is two things. Number one, asymmetry. It's kind of hard when you have two structures that are the same, right? So two breasts or two ears, and you're trying to make those absolutely symmetrical. It's hard to make those perfectly symmetrical. Well, because as in nature, things are rarely perfectly symmetrical. Yeah, so you have a beautiful five-year-old and you go to the top-notch plastic surgeon, are you gonna accept that answer? Unlikely. Okay, good. <laughs> so uh, you're not gonna accept that answer. So you have to go to someone who's proficient with these surgeries. Again, it's kind of a niche procedure. Definitely at a university setting with a craniofacial surgeon, certain cosmetic surgeons that do cosmetic surgery like me do these, and those are the people that like it. Usually we're trained in craniofacial surgery. So uh, that's the first thing is asymmetry. It's sometimes very hard to make them perfectly symmetrical. For us, what we do is we tell people, this is a, kind of exactly what you can expect. Mm -hmm. And especially if it's a parent with a child. And that's really helpful because we lay it out there and we do exactly what we talk about. And then so they get those results and they feel like this is good. This is what we talked about. This is our result. Um, again, if it's not perfectly symmetrical, maybe it's 90, 95% symmetrical. In those kind of small differences, you'll never see 
in any person. A lay person, I mean, you're not going to look at someone's ears and say, well, you, you had a 5% difference in your helix and anti-helix. I would love for someone to say that because I would like take that, that person maybe a child prodigy and make them into a plastic <laughs> surgeon. Well, I think too, you know, when we look at people, we're rarely focused on their ears, especially when we're looking straight at them. And like right now, I can't see both of your ears. Can you see it now? Yeah, and that one sticks out a little bit more. <laughs> You're so mean. You're left. It always has. It wings out just a tiny oh bit. Oh my gosh. It's the it's the wavy ear. Let's figure out how I can fix that myself. Right. I got a staple gun. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Just wear the LeBron James headband. There you the go. Then no one will notice. Yeah. Um, so, and then the other problem is, especially with the Mastardi technique, is that sutures loosen, mm -hmm. and you get kind of reversal to where you were. So not just that the asymmetry I'm talking about would be if it just wasn't repaired correct, not correctly, but maybe not the same on both sides, or you couldn't make it look the same. But another problem is these tend to like kind of move back to where they were. Mm -hmm. Uh, regress, whatever the layperson term is for that. So you throw them something. I, I think regress actually yeah. is a good word. Is that yeah. too? Yeah. All right. So in that situation, it kind of goes back, and that's obviously traumatic and frustrating. We fortunately haven't had that problem. You know, one of the things when they started doing all these uh, scoring techniques on the uh, cartilage and burring and, and all these kind of things was is that they felt that that would have less of a recurrence. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is with the scoring and uh, uh, burying the cartilage, you can have sharp edges. And or it looks, scar tissue. Well, it, it's not just that, but it's just, it's more sharp edges mm -hmm. where the cartilage spins, and that looks unnatural. Yeah. You know, and that's why I like the, personally like the Mastardi technique. Mastardi did this, you know, in the 60s and 70s, and some of these techniques are newer, so people tend to want to do the newer techniques. I actually think the Mastardi technique is, is probably the best. Mm -hmm. But I do a little bit of both. Sometimes I'll score it. Sometimes I'll take out conchal cartilage. Uh, that's the bowl uh, where, they, where the sound waves go in. Uh, if I have to, to tack the ear back. I do different things, kind of mix and match some of these surgeries. So those are the two things, recurrence or it goes back to the way it was or somewhat like it was, and then as uh, persistent asymmetries after surgery. Other than that, the infection rate is extremely low. The scar rate behind the ear is almost like non-existent because there's no tension on that wound. Right. You don't take any skin out. Sometimes you do a little bit if you have to tack it back a lot, but most of the times you don't. And, uh, you know, having permanent sutures in there, sometimes those can be visible or poke through. Yeah, they are. The permanent sutures are typically a very dark color, like blue. And so, yeah, so if someone had extremely fair skin, uh, you may be able to perceive a little hint of color. But there again, this is a person who is literally like, looking for it yeah no one's going to stand behind you and see that because it's going to be tucked in behind at the crease of your ear yeah and if you had to you could take some of those sutures out mm -hmm. uh if you had to yeah but you know then you can get concerned about it recurring uh i would say by and large this is of all the surgeries we do probably has the highest satisfaction rate yeah because it's kind of a, a small little thing for parents, it's a huge deal, and they're so happy with the results. For adults, it's kind of an add-on thing. They don't usually, you know, they're not coming in, they're like, you know, all I want is my ears tucked. It's usually like, you know, can you tuck my ears also at the same time of doing this facelift or something? And it just seems to please almost everyone universally. Again, you have to go to someone who's good with these kind of surgeries, and there's a lot of people that do them, so just check out their websites, talk to the office. Uh, if you're in a place that's not well represented, you can go to a university hospital and talk to a craniofacial surgeon. That's a surgeon that usually works on children with uh, disorders, facial disorders. And uh, you can feel very confident that you're gonna, your results are going to be really good. Mm -hmm. Low risk procedure, high gain. Great return on your investment. It is. It really is. And I think it's it's a very freeing surgery, if that makes sense, because people, I think, subconsciously are always kind of hiding it. You know, when, especially adults, you know, they've learned how to hide it. We had that patient uh, who said that, and she had really curly hair. Mm -hmm. And she goes, I never wear my hair up. Yep. And I was like, that's crazy. She's like, never. Not when it's hot, when I'm out exercising, I never, ever do. It's just something that's always bothered me in my entire life. We did the surgery, and she literally came in like four months later. With her hair in a ponytail. With her like hair a in a ponytail. ponytail. And it, oh, it was, she was mm -hmm. rocking the ponytail, and we were like telling her, like, it's awesome, you're rocking the ponytail. Yeah. Right? So, is that a huge thing in someone's life? In her life, it was. Yeah, I think it would be. Well, and think if you were a guy in that same situation, you don't have the luxury, maybe, of being able to, you know, have your hair down in every situation always. Guys tend to, I don't know, guys are different sometimes. They don't perceive it as much. I have a friend who I trained with, 
he has very, very prominent ears, but it just never seemed to bother him. Yeah. Well, that's just people. I yeah. Mean, I guess it depends on the person. It does. That's just people. <laughs> All right. Do we miss anything else, Amy? I don't know. Are we out of slides? Yeah. Well, this one, this kind of shows you an example. If you look mm -hmm. on, again, our YouTube channel, at Jason Martin MD, uh, you can see an example of a result. The top picture um, is a, uh, you can see that the antihelix, the area underneath the top of the ear, it, the, the cartilage there, the ridges are not really prominent and not well defined. And below, you can see they're much more defined. And you can get the idea that that turns the ear back and also makes the ear shape better. Mm -hmm. So it's not as pointed, more rounded, and also the angle where the ear comes off from the head is better. That's a really great result. Yeah, really, really good mm -hmm. result. So um, again, it's hard to explain these on a podcast, but you just go on our YouTube channel and take a look if you're interested. These are really, really neat surgeries. Honestly, one of my favorites. Uh, apparently, I'm gonna have to come up with a different technique. And then, Maybe not an instrument. Maybe what I'll do is I'll come up with a headband that's okay. special for otoplasty. Post otoplasty yeah. dressing. Right. Maybe Kanye West can help me design it. Um, <laughs> anyways, so that's it. I think so. We love otoplasties, aka ear pinning, aka cosmetic ear surgery. Uh, we do these in the office. Local anesthesia, low risk, high gain. Uh, people are very happy. So if you have prominent ears, you have a child who has prominent ears, uh, you have a friend who struggles with this. Find an expert in your area. Don't be afraid. Uh, we highly recommend this procedure. You won't regret it. Uh, and the satisfaction rate is extremely high. It is. So be sure to follow us on at Beauty and the Surgeon podcast on Instagram. We also have beautyandthesurgeonpodcast.com and at Jason Martin MD on all social media. That's right. We we're, have Beauty and the Surgeon swag too. We're repping our way, own brand. Which we have our own coffee mugs. So awesome. we may have to give those away pretty soon. Shouldn't say that out loud. But. It might be. Hey, if, if, please leave us a rating review. It's immensely helpful. And you know, at some point in the future, we may be giving away a Beauty and the Surgeon mug for those of you who are leaving us excellent reviews. That's awesome. Uh, and then also, if you want information about otoplasty, I believe we have this on our website, um, jasonmartinmd.com. Uh, but you can just Google otoplasty, O-T-O-plasty, P-L-A-S-T-Y. And common spelling. Yeah, common spelling. Dot and, com. Dot com. <laughs> and then there's uh, tons of articles in there. Most of them are scientific, but there's a few good ones I thought was pretty good. Visit our website, jasonmartinmd.com, or check out Google. All right. So it's been great to talk about otoplasty. What are we talking about next? I don't know. It's a big surprise. Big surprise. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>